Well, good evening. My name is Anita Farrington. I am the Associate Dean of Student Affairs at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. And I would like to welcome all of you to our sixth annual Diversity in STEM Summit. Our theme this year is inclusive innovation, impacting the future of STEM. Now, before we begin, I know I have a lot of friends and colleagues and alumni uh, shout out to all the students who are working so hard. I just wanna thank everyone in advance. Thank you to our presenters. Uh, we have quite an incredible lineup tonight. So I'm just, I'm just thrilled and cannot wait to get started. So our theme this evening is putting intention into action, building a diverse STEM pipeline. It's all about the pipeline tonight. We're going to be doing a deep dive into what inclusive innovation in STEM really means through the lens of each of these speakers that you're going to be hearing from. They are all intentional and they're all very dedicated in the work that they're doing to address the needs and the wants and the problems of those who are historically not included. They are also improving access, career opportunities in their organizations. I can tell you that all of them are mentoring and mentoring again. They are doing a part to move the needle in terms of a more inclusive climate in their environments. Inclusive, and I wanna say, and belonging. And I'm stealing that from Dr. Lisa Coleman, who's going to talk to you a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. But most importantly, the common thread it, that, that goes straight across is that they all understand the importance of a very, very strong, diverse pipeline of students. Now, this evening, I want to begin our program by paying tribute to a man whose life work was centered around the pipeline. His name is Dr. Irving McPhail, and many of us knew him as an iconic force to be reckoned with. As a matter of fact, Dr. McPhail knew many of the presenters tonight that are on this panel, and on occasion, he would give us a good talking to. He would remind us of the acute disparities of students of color entering the pipeline. And he would remind us to pay attention to the qualitative data. He would always talk about the qualitative data of these individuals as we were in our roles, evaluating them for admissions and for scholarship and for fellowship opportunities. For many years, he served as the president and CEO of NACME. NACME is the National Action Council of Minorities in Engineering. And Tandon is a very proud member of that organization. Through that organization, we were actually able to support hundreds of fellowships, of, of scholarships over the year, years to historically uh, underrepresented students. In 2010, he received an honorary doctorate from the engineering school. He was very, very proud of that medal. And his last appointment was as president of St. Augustine's University. It's a historically black college and university. He wrote to me in August, actually August 1st. He was very excited about his appointment. He was also excited about creating a new regional STEM center on that campus. This is what he said. He said, Anita, I am thrilled to be at the helm of an HBCU at this pivotal moment in the saga of race relations in this country. The Black Lives Matter movement and the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on communities of color have catalyzed renewed focus on the education of African-Americans. And now I'm going to share another quote from him. This is what he said. He said, engineers are the visionaries of the future and diverse engineering work for us is key to maintaining a competitive edge. We must grow the pipeline, he said, of qualified underrepresented minority engineers and scientists to fill positions in industry and academia. And on that note, and in that spirit, of Dr. Irving McPhail, we will begin tonight's program. So first, 
I am delighted to introduce you to Dr. Lisa Coleman, who will deliver welcome remarks. Dr. Coleman is New York University's inaugural Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation and the Chief Diversity Officer. According to NYU President Andy Hamilton, Dr. Coleman works with the Office of the Provost, Deans, Senior Leaders, Internal Stakeholders, and External Partners to advance, promote, and build capacity for strategic global inclusion, diversity, equity, belongingness, and innovation initiatives across NYU's global network. And she's quite a globe trotter before this pandemic. So what came out of this is that she is stationary now and we are at her locally on campus from all directions, as you can imagine. Now you're going to hear a theme here about her career path. So prior to coming to NYU, Dr. Coleman served as Harvard University's first special assistant to the president and its first chief diversity officer. While there, she and her team developed some of the first initiatives focused on the intersections of technology and disability. Now, before her time at Harvard, she directed the Africana program at Tufts University and was later appointed as what? As that institution's first global inclusion and diversity executive reporting to the president. I have to tell you, this is there's one thing to be an entrepreneur, but to be an entrepreneur and to be a first chief diversity officer, this is her third time, prayers and my hat off to you. Extraordinary. Dr. Coleman earned her doctorate in social and cultural analysis, American studies from NYU, she's a proud alum, and three master's degrees from the Ohio State University, first one in African and African American studies the second, women's gender and sexuality studies. And the last, uh, that, that was in communication studies. And who knows, with Lisa, there may be another one coming because she, she works on a 48 hour day. Okay, so this is why she has time for all of this. I'm just so honored. Uh, she is my good friend and she is my colleague. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. The stage is yours, Dr. Coleman. Thank you so much, Anita. I appreciate that warm and wonderful <laughs> introduction. Yeah, I guess I, I'm a, a, a first. I like being a first, or, and uh, I like to say I'm a startup, you know? Uh, so greetings, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's always a pleasure. I used to just love to come to Brooklyn and come over to Tandon. And so uh, when I'm able to do so, I will do that again. Obviously, as Anita said, I'm Lisa Coleman, and you can see that, and I'm the senior vice president here. Uh, and I use she and her pronouns, uh, which is also there. You can see that in my window. And so I just have to say to Anita, thank you for that introduction. But also, I just want to thank you. I'm going to come back to this at the end. But as many of you know, nearly after 40 years of service and leadership at NYU, Anita is retiring. And I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. But the way that she talked about Dr. Irving McPhail and, and, and his work, I just like to underscore that Anita has way, just contributed for over 40 years to NYU and her work has opened up pathways for numerous students, alums, her engagement has been amazing. And this is just one example tonight uh, for this uh, annual uh, summit that she has just, it's been terrific. And I've had the privilege, privilege to participate in the last three years that I've been here, so thank you. And as your colleagues in uh, Tandon note, each fall you ask incoming students, what will you do? So as you begin to your well-earned retirement, we must ask ourselves what we will do to continue to springboard the impact that you've made across so many generations of NYU STEM scholars, and as well as the impact that you've had across so many of the schools across NYU as in your work. What we must be doing in exploring uh, spaces like this week's diversity and STEM summit focused on innovation, and we must be doing in our day-to-day -day work in advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and access in STEM and beyond. And you have provided an amazing model of that over the years. I'd also like to just uh, also say, I hope everyone's taking good care out there. 
Uh, these are challenging times in many, many ways for many people in, and the impact, uh, the disparate impact on people across varying communities, as we know, has been tremendous. So I like to say, uh, please take care of yourselves as you take care of others. So many of us in marginalized communities take care of other people. And so so we have to remember, we also have to put on, as Anita said, I'm quite quite the globe trotter, or at least I used to be. And uh, when you first get on a plane, they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first before you help others. And so let's remember that um, to take good care of ourselves as we take care of others. I'd also like to take a moment to honor those who have become before us, our ancestors, the indigenous people upon whose land we all sit and occupy. I want to honor those who, whose lives have been lost historically and most recently in acts of violence, in acts of uh, discrimination, racism, xenophobia, those known to us and those unknown to us. So please join me in a few seconds of silence and reflection. Thank you. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge all the people behind the scenes and our frontline workers. So healthcare professionals and everyone who's doing great work out there. And of course, all the people who are working behind the scenes whose labor is often discounted unseen. The people are, uh, so that's people who are working in our labs. Some of are the assistant techs, uh, people who are cleaning the hospitals, delivery workers, et cetera. Thank you. And we want to acknowledge the, uh, the essential work that you are doing to keep so many of us, uh, as they say, safe. A lot has happened this year. We're in the midst of health and social crises and transformation. A quick glance at the news will show, as Anita Farrington mentioned, that for many parts of the country and the world, uh, cases of COVID-19 are on the rise again with continued disproportionate impacts among marginalized communities, particularly BIPOC, uh, low income communities, as well as the disproportionate intersectional impact on women and women of color. Gender disparities are being intensified and realized in home spaces. And we certainly see this, whether you've read, the, read it in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, women's publishing rates and women's research is down. The digital divide continues. We have issues around food insecurity and the educa educational and steward and impacts have been vast. I've done a lot of talks about this recently and obviously uh, the impact on mental health and wellness. The importance of the work that we have to do to innovate a stronger and more equitable future has become all the more evident and all the more vital. It is important that each of us across the NYU community and beyond, not only recognize the urgency and scope of the impact during this pandemic, but continue to prioritize how we work together and how we work in collaboration. Some people have heard me say this, we're in a collaboration revolution. There was the industrial revolution, the information revolution, and the collaboration revolution. So at OGI, we serve as strategic consultants to help us think about what, how these collaborations across our schools, units, and departments will work to advance this, the DEI and access issues. Research is clear that more than ever, diverse teams are the most successful. Uh, for those of you who've read Scott Page's book, The Diversity Bonus, high IQ versus a diverse group, the diverse group outperforms. Diverse teams are essential to creating innovative technologies, research, and new knowledge production. We also know that our world's most complex problems require thinking and getting outside of the box. And we've seen that right now, obviously in terms of some of the work. Who thought that we'd have multiple pharmaceutical companies work together in collaboration? Who thought that we would have varying people thinking about the racial strife and companies thinking about racial justice and racial equity? We've seen the gender global inequities and the digital divides and how people are trying to solve for those broadband access, thinking about how we provide that kind of access for people who many of whom, and we know people who earn over under a certain amount are usually using their phones for internet access. There's been progress, but we still have much to do work to do to accelerate our progress, particularly as we think about uh, women and historically underrepresented groups in STEM. So putting into action and building a diverse STEM pipeline 
and furthering our STEM access is key. This year's summit, as we know, is doing a deep dive and looking at industry, rethinking traditional approaches, thinking about how we ensure diverse learners through our K through 12 grades and looking at how we can develop even better partnerships and what inclusive partnerships we can create even with community colleges. So that we're looking at the pipeline across so that we are developing STEM scholars and new STEM and interest across the board with our young people. We started a few initiatives here at NYU as well. We have something called our NYU Be Together initiative. And part of what Anita mentioned earlier is that's what we're doing. We're doubling down on diversity, equity, and inclusion here at NYU. Because what we know is that with the millennials, Gen Z, and those 12-year-old, 10-year-old alpha generations, they're the most diverse generations in history. And they come to higher education first. So how do we build and leverage that diversity so that we are actually, as people come into our community, that they do have a sense of belonging, that they begin to feel part of a community. So our first initiative I'll talk about is something called NYU Be Together. It's building on a major data assessment. I'm a big data person. And probably, I don't know if you could tell that from my background. My first uh, major was computer science, uh, my undergraduate major. And so we conducted, a, conducted an assessment and, and collected a great deal of data. And we're using that data to recenter our action and innovation and transformation initiatives. In South Africa, they call chief diversity officers, chief transformation officers. That's how I think of myself, a transformation officer, transforming, starting up, transforming institutions, practices, policies. We're deepening in education and training. We have a new initiative called Responsive and Difficult Dialogues. We have global inclusion officers appointed all across our schools to ensure that at the local area, whether it's in STEM or in the arts or in, in uh, global pu and public health or our education school, that we're bringing the best practices from across the institution so that we can use those best practices to co-create together. We're using innovation, right? The tagline of my title is global diversity and in a global inclusion and innovation. And innovation is required to reimagine what is possible. The future of higher education, we just started a new program bringing together uh, uh, scholars from New Zealand and India and South Africa to talk about what the future of higher education will look like and what will it look like as we talk about robotics and AI and STEM. Partnership with companies and leadership entities. And uh, Anita out there knows we started a partnership with Disney and we have a great intern uh, actually from the School of Engineering who was appointed into Walt Disney uh, Imagineering. So really thinking about those cross sector partnerships and how do we grow and influence industry and those industry partnerships. And I'm so glad that we have so many people uh, on the panel who are gonna talk also a little bit about that. Thinking about our maker spaces, right? Bringing together creatives with engineers and thinking about the Institute of Public Knowledge and how we work about creating new knowledge. We have faculty diversification efforts. We know that that's important for our students and also for how we deliver education, right? And deliver on that promise of education that engages diverse minds and diverse research. We have cluster hiring project ongoing. We have mentor workshops. We have publishing efforts to help our faculty get their work out there. We have a new partnership with HR. We have a new partnership with student government. We have, as I said, mentorship programs. These are just some of the work that we're doing. But as I said, it's about transformation and transformation is both short, medium and long-term. So we're developing those goals as we move along but we couldn't do it without partners like we have in STEM. And so again, I'd just like to thank Anita Farrington. Anita, you have been an inspirational, inspirational leader. As I came into NYU, you were one of the people who welcomed me so wholeheartedly. Many people don't know this story, but I'm gonna tell it here and I hope you don't mind, Anita. Let me so, mute myself again. <laughs> I don't want anyone to I'm glad to hear you story. laugh, Anita. I'm, a, I'm afraid. So I have to okay, tell I'm it. I have to tell the story. So before I came to NYU, I worked, as Anita said, at Harvard University. 
the summer before I came to NYU, I'd actually quit working at Harvard University to join NYU, which put me quite frankly in a little bit of a predicament because every summer I would go to the vineyard for some events. And usually I stayed with my Harvard people. And this summer I was not going to do that. I needed to find alternative arrangements as I was coming to NYU. And I admit I was a little late in getting my making my arrangements. So I make my arrangements, I rent a place uh, I, I'm sorry, I said the, the vineyard. I meant to say uh, Sag Harbor, uh, the, the Hampton and Sag Harbor. So I, uh, I go there and um, so I rent a place. I go to Sag Harbor, I'm staying in this basement apartment, which by the way, was the most lovely basement apartment I've ever seen. And uh, I meet this woman and she invites me up and I meet her daughter. And then eventually she says, well, I work at NYU. And I'm like, oh, wow, you do? And so I don't tell her right then that I'm gonna probably be working there because you know the, the, I'm not sure that the I's and the T's have been dotted yet. Fast forward, I come to NYU and who is it? Who, 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 who do we realize? I'm gonna be the chief diversity officer and Anita Farrington, of course, is in the Tandon School of Engineering. We then remember and reunite. And I have to say ever since then, it's been just a joy. So I just wanna say, Anita, you are actually probably the person that got me to NYU as I was homeless. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find a place to stay. Thank you for taking, taking me in. But seriously, I knew then when I met Anita that she was an extraordinary person. And coming into NYU, that was just solidified. If you don't know and if you haven't talked to colleagues all across, Tandon all across, quite frankly, all of NYU, what they will tell you is Anita Farrington is someone that you can depend on, someone who is completely committed, someone who has been a steward of so much of what we do in this space. And when you talk to alums, which I love to do, and students, they are just fans, um, unbelievable fans of Anita Farrington because she deeply cares about the students and the alums and this work. We are going to miss you, Anita Farrington. We we're talking earlier about repurposing. I'm a little jealous, as I said, I, I want to repurpose sooner rather than later. Um, not sure I'll be able to do that, but I'm try. But you will be missed. Thank you for your 40 years of extraordinary contributions to advance inclusion in science, technology, engineering, math, and beyond. I don't know what I'm going to do without you, Anita. I probably will be homeless, but I'm gonna figure it out. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Tandon has been better because of you. Lisa Coleman, thank you so much. You weren't supposed to do this. Because I know. I've got to get know. through. I've got to get through it tonight. Okay. This is. I know. I know, Anita, but I got to take the time. I'm going to do it again, but I'm just doing it right now. I, got, I had to do it. This is my last official event for all, for, for all of our participants that are that are saying, "What is going on here?" Um, but listen, let me. I will talk a little bit about the next chapter. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what? I am repurposing. So. <laughs> my eye on what's and I'm an NYU alum. Oh, I know you are. See, and that's what I'm also afraid of. I know I'm going to get the emails. Lisa, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm going to keep my eye on everything pipeline related. So listen, thank you so much. Thank you. Let me just end, say thank you to all of our engineering partners across the school, to all the people with whom you work. And thank you to everyone who's organized the panel. I have to say thank you to Randy and of course, to our rock star panel. I'm excited for this discussion. So Anita, I turn it back over to you. And all I can thank say you, is friend hugs. Friend and colleague, thank you. You always have a home here in the Hamptons. So okay, <laughs> here we go. So now I would like to I'd like to invite Tandon student Dorothy Belton. She is going to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Carl Reed. Uh, thank you, Dina. Hi, everyone. My name is Dorothy Belton. I am a senior at Tanding, studying electrical engineer. Um, I am also part of the executive board at the Nesby chapter here. I am the program chair and also past president. And I do also serve on the region one board for Nesby as the metropolitan zone chair. 
Dr. Carl Reed was named the Executive Director of National Society of Black Engineers, NSBE, on June 2nd, 2014, marking his return to the organization that gave him his first major le leadership experience 32 years late earlier. For the past 22 years, he's been a leading advocate for increasing college access, opportunity, and the success for low-income and minor minority youth. Dr. Reed came to Nesby from the United Negro College Fund, where he oversaw new program development, research, and capacity for building organizations, 37 historically Black colleges and universities, and held the title of Senior Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Member College Engagement. Before his service at the United Negro College Fund, he worked in positions of progressive responsibility to increase the diversity of his alter model, the Massachusetts Institute of, M of Technology, MIT, who he le left as an associate dean of undergraduate education and the director of office minority education. While working at MIT as the director of engineering outreach programs, Dr. Reed earned his doctorate of education degree at Harvard University. His dissertation explored the interrelationship of race, identity, and academic achievement. He is the author of Working Smarter, Not Just Harder, Three Sensible Strategies for Succeeding in College and Life. Dr. Reed was born in Bronx, New York, and grew up in Roosevelt, New York, a mostly working class African-American community in Long Island. The value, the high value his parents placed on education and his admission to the well-resourced Magnet High School near, Ro near Roosevelt put him on track to follow his older brother to MIT, where he earned his undergraduate and master's degree in material science and engineering and was a, a Tau Beta Pi scholar. His credit he credits his membership to Nesby Chapter MIT with go giving a vital boost to his self-confidence and leadership skills. He joined the society during his freshman year, was elected chapter vice president his junior year, and subsequently served as Nesby national chairperson. After graduating MIT, Dr. Reed worked in the computer industry for 12 years in product management, marketing, sales, and consulting. In 1991, five years into his successful career in sales and marketing with IBM Corporation, Dr. Reed read Jonathan's Kozol Savage Inequalities, a seminal book about education disparities in the United States, which sparked his passion for bringing about positive change through education of African Americans and other underserved populations. Dr. Reed sits on the DC STEM Council, the Dean's Advisory Cabinet of Harvard University School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, as well as the Dean's Advisory Council for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Michigan College of Engineering. He holds memberships in the American Association of Engineering Societies, the American Society of Engineering Education, in the Council of Engineering and Scientific Society Executive. Dr. Reed is also a founding member of the 50K Co Coalition, a national effort to produce 50,000 diversity engineering graduates annually by 2025. He was recently named a top 10, a top 100 executive in America by Uptown Professional Magazines. He is a frequent contributor to the National Diversity Engineering Dialogue, author of several commentaries pieces on, and quoted in numerous articles such as Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, U.S. News and World Report, and The Hikers Report. Dr. Reed is now supporting Nesby's National Society, Nesby's National Executive Board, and societies of 25,000 active members in reaching the main goal of Nesby's 10 year strategic plan to end the underrepresentation of Blacks in engineering in the US by annually producing 10,000 Black engineers in the country by 2025. Now, introducing Dr. Carl Reed. Dorothy, thank you so very much for that uh, kind introduction and, and generous. Uh, uh, words. I, I very much appreciate this. I was trying to give you the, <laughs> the kind of like, you don't have to read all that, but I appreciate it. And um, I'm so honored to be a part of this, uh, this uh, diversity and STEM summit uh, as well. And, um, and I, I kind of echo uh, Dr. Coleman's words about Anita Farrington. Uh, we got to know each other over the past uh, couple of years, really. Uh, through the GEM Fellowship and a number of other initiatives uh, that we've we've had, and we also share a love and appreciation for Dr. Irv McPhail, who was uh, a mentor of mine and a partner in the 50K Coalition. In fact, he participated at when he was president and CEO of NACME in every single one of our convenings, and he served on our advisory board. And we um, we actually owe him 
a great deal of debt because he designed our community college linkage strategy for the 50K Coalition, which is to produce 50,000 Black, Latinx, female, and Native American engineers annually by 2025. And so, um, so it was a huge loss um, that uh, when, when we lost him earlier this year, uh, but he continues, uh, his legacy continues through me and, and many others, countless others. It's, it's, it's remarkable what kind of life uh, he's led and, and the legacy he's led uh, as well. Also wanna give a shout out to NYU. Uh, my sister's alma mater, she earned her, her law degree from, from NYU many years ago. And uh, I have a special place in my heart for, for, the, for the university uh, as well because of that, that experience. In fact, I left the prom in Boston, um, took a train, over, uh, took a bus overnight just to see her, to participate in her graduation uh, one year. And so uh, I have special memories, although I was pretty upset about uh, shortening the prom. Anyway. Um, so what I think I want to do is uh, talk with you about this this whole notion of of diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, and and I, I tell you I was so very impressed with Dr. Coleman's presentation. I just kept saying Amen, Amen, Amen uh, because of the because of uh, how she framed this. And I know sometimes it takes uh, two or three times to kind of leave an impression. So you will find that a lot of my, my messaging will be very similar to hers and it will build on, on some of the work that she's done and some of her words as well. In fact, Scott Page, who, who wrote the diversity bonus, uh, is one of my champions uh, in terms of articulating the, the, the value of diversity um, because most people um, who, who get diversity don't just get diversity just because it's the right thing to do, but they get diversity because they, they understand what's in it for them as well. And it's unfortunate we have to get to that, but in some populations, that's really what, what's necessary. And so Scott Page has done a, a great deal of work uh, in that area. So the first thing I wanted to do is just kind of paint the picture of Nesby um, and, and where we are globally. Uh, we are a global society. We were founded in 1975 uh, by six students from the south side of Chicago uh, who were attending Purdue University at the time. And today we are over 21,000 members, uh, over 700 chapters worldwide. As you could see the breakdown of the collegiate members who are the heart of the organization, very much like Dorothy, and she's taken the role that I once had when I was at MIT, a chapter officer, um, we, we pride ourselves in leadership development as, as a society. But we also have a pipeline, over 4,000 uh, pre-collegiate students in our Nesby Junior Program. And Anita is one of the advisors from one of uh, our 250 Nesby Junior chapters worldwide. Uh, and then over 4,000 professionals as well in roughly 90 chapters uh, around the country and in, in, uh, in, in Western Africa and in, in Canada as well. As you can see the breakdown of gender, um, we have only 33% of our members identify as female. And, and at, we, we're about 20%, 10 percentage points higher than the national average, but we have a long way to go to get to equity, roughly about 51%. And we're working on that. We've got strategies to get there uh, as well. Um, one of the challenges that we have yet to solve is, is the underrepresentation of women and people of color in engineering. And so this is a, a, a snapshot report that was done a few years ago by the Association of Public Land Grant Universities that looked at the degrees, the share of degrees, bachelor's degrees awarded by race and ethnicity. And you could see there that African Americans were just making up 3.9% of all engineering degrees, about 125,000 engineering degrees awarded. Uh, the Latinx, uh, Hispanic Latinx was 10.7%. That's gone up since that time. African Americans has gone up to 4.3%. So we're, we're pleased at the progress. And yet it still represents an underrepresentation, as it, as it were. It's kind of like leaving uh, a star athlete on the bench um, and expecting the team to win. We, are, we can't win if we don't uh, increase the representation of, of people of color and women uh, in engineering. And that's the work we're doing. In Nesby, five years ago, we announced a bold strategy to work with colleges and universities to nearly triple the number of Black engineers they graduate on an annual basis from about 3,500, at the time was 3.5%, to 10,000, which would get us roughly at parity. 
um, we've seen a major progress over the over the five years. Uh, as you could see there, a 61% increase, but we've got ways to go in the next five years. And so for those of you who are part of NSBE, um, who want to be a part of NSBE, you'll be hearing shortly a brand new refresh of our strategic plan we're calling Game Change 2025, which talks about the um, articulated pathway between a kindergartner who wants to, we want to generate interest in STEM to uh, a, a, a someone who um, matriculates into school, then goes into uh, college and university, graduates with a very high GPA, and then moves on into the corporate or in academia. So we, we actually do this now, but we're really going to be intentional about doing this through data and analysis, as Dr. Coleman talks about, because you can't manage what you can't measure uh, as a society. So you'll be hearing more about that uh, shortly. That, uh, Anita and, and um, both Dorothy and Anita mentioned the 50K Coalition. Uh, five years ago, we partnered with the Society of Women Engineers, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, and the American Indian Science and Engineering Society to multiply that 2025 effect that we have announced with NSBE with the other associations uh, to produce 50,000 diverse engineers annually by 2025. And so uh, we've got 60 organizations that are part of this, 33 colleges and universities, 22 engineering societies and five corporations. And we just received, just announced uh, today, a $2.2 million grant over the next three years that will enable us to grow that, that the, uh, the coalition nationally to 160 organizations and affect uh, really about 45,000 uh, students of color and women uh, in engineering. So more to come about that, but you'll, you'll be hearing more about that. And we welcome NYU Tandon to, to join this effort, this national movement to transform the face of engineering. Now, one of the things that uh, Dr. Coleman talked about was the diversity bonus. And I love this, this whole notion of diversity because now we are, are understanding that there's a value associated with diversity. This is not just a good thing to do. There is an imperative, a strategic imperative that companies that are embracing diversity are really experiencing. And Franz Johansson, uh, who is uh, who's, uh, at Harvard Business School, uh, when he was at Harvard Business School, came up with this whole notion that when you bring together uh, people and concepts and frameworks at the intersection is birth new innovation and new ideas. And so he, he, he kind of talked about a, a few different quotes that are associated with it. And I wanna focus on this the last one given the time that's available. He says the best chance of coming up with great new ideas is when we mix diverse perspectives, fields, cultures, and backgrounds. So I'm a materials engineer. And uh, by training, I got a bachelor and master's degree in materials engineering. Materials engineering was a combination of the intersection of physics, chemistry, and engineering together. So in and of itself, it, it is, it is the, 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 um, the product of this Medici effect. The Medici family was behind the Italian Renaissance, bringing together all these cultures that gave birth to a whole new way that human beings kind of interacted and innovated as well. So there's power and diversity. However, so this is why we do all the things that we do, building the pipelines, uh, tripling the number of black engineers, working with uh, the other organizations. But I do want to say that diversity is not inclusion. So all this effort to increase the numbers and the representation is one thing, but creating inclusive environments is the key, is the success. In fact, that's what uh, McKinsey and company announced recently in their report in 2020 that said that hiring diverse talent isn't enough or enrolling diverse students isn't enough. It's experience they have in the workplace or on the campus or in the classroom that shapes whether or not they remain and thrive. So the problem is not the student. The problem is not the employee. The problem is not that woman who is the only engineer on the shop floor, et cetera. If she leaves or if they leave, or, or if, 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 if someone who is a, a trans leaves, it's the problem is the workplace, it's the culture. And so one of the things we have to do is kind of shape the culture to be much more inclusive so that everyone can feel that they can thrive. Then of course, we've had this other major set of challenges uh, as Dr. Coleman talked about, the, the global pandemic and, and its disparate effect on black and brown communities and low-income communities. The economic crisis, five percentage points higher uh, is the unemployment rate among African-Americans, one of the largest gaps um, than, than it's been in history. 
um, in recent history. And then of course, the killing of George Floyd in, on May 25th sort of shifted the focus and caused a national reckoning, not just about race and ethnicity and racism, but about equity and social justice. So diversity is important. Inclusion is key, but the next thing we have to really work on is equity. Making sure that people who bring different uh, uh, experiences and skills and abilities to the table have what they need in order for them to thrive. This is not just about equality of inputs. You can have equality of inputs as this cartoon points about, but you still have inequity in that regard. What we're talking about is creating an equitable environment to ensure that everyone can thrive at, 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 at their levels. So, so I, I partnered with a group of people uh, in the Washington DC area to launch a brand new nonprofit called the Black Idea Coalition. IDEA standing for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Action. It's a nonprofit. And the whole goal was to help companies and other organizations translate their pledges of, of, of racial equity and working with black lives, supporting black lives, et cetera, to action, moving, moving from pledges to action. And so we've kind of identified as part of our model, a five uh, elements, uh, five elements of the component. One is not just to focus on diversity, right? Representative parity, including those at the board of directors. Organizations should be looking at the board of directors, their C-suites, their the mid managers, et cetera, but also around equity, looking at and assessing and documenting any kind of cases of, of, of disparities in terms of employing statistics on recruiting and hiring, compensation, departures, who's leaving, EOC complaints, et cetera, making sure that we achieve equity and when there's disparity, addressing those as well. I talked about inclusion. And what do I mean by that? It's not just dealing with microaggressions and, and, and eliminating or mitigating implicit biases, but also creating an anti-racist institutional culture. I'm having discussions with CEOs saying it's not enough to be an assimilationist. It's not enough to be a non-racist. You have to be actively working on being an anti-racist, uh, whether you're black, brown, blue, or green, doesn't really matter in order to uh, really create inclusive environments. And then finally, uh, second, uh, second to finally, is the ecosystems. Looking at uh, the networks, the supplier networks and other uh, networks to ensure that you as a company or you as a university or you as a student are working on the things in the community so that you're making the communities better as well. And the fifth one that's not listed on the left, but it's on the bottom is making sure data are available, ensuring that everybody is held accountable to the data, uh, accountable to, uh, to, uh, to transparent data on DEI metrics as well. So we're working with companies, we're working with uh, nonprofits and others to actually move the needle with regards to uh, this inclusivity model. Then the last thing I'll just say is uh, inclusion is that optimal state. So remember that picture of equity and inclusion, right? E equity and equality, they were all behind the fence. What we're trying to do is get everybody out onto the field and contributing to the game as it were, uh, as a result. And so what I mean by inclusion is requiring the, the experience of feeling valued for your uniqueness as a person as an individual, not a person of color, not of a black person, not a white person, not a gay person, et cetera, et cetera. It's really you as an individual, your feeling of uniqueness and sense of belonging. When that happens, you thrive. When you feel that sense of belonging, you certainly thrive. And so this is my contact information. Uh, we mentioned the book, Working Smarter. If you are a student, especially a freshman, um, or you, if you're a student and are struggling, I recommend it. Um, it came out of my own struggles as an undergraduate student and the things that I learned and began to teach and, and, and the research about working smarter, attitude shift, behavior shift, and connection shift are the key elements uh, as well. So I'm honored to be a part of this. Thank you for having me. And I'll turn it back over to, uh, to our moderator. Well, thank you, Dr. Reed. As always, I am taking notes. Every time I see you present, I am busy taking notes. Thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, I know how busy you are. And, um, and this is, it, this, you have framed it. And thank you especially for talking about the early part of the pipeline, because so often we focus on high school students and beyond. Um, I, I do want to say, um, before I bring the three, um, our three U.S. National Laboratory um, representatives out, 
I want to talk about, because they're going to focus on college through doctoral and even postdoctoral pipeline, but I do want to shine light on some of the incredible work that is being done and give you a couple of quick examples. Um, these are organizations really focusing on middle school and high school. The first is an organization called Engineering Tomorrow. And they are providing free virtual and hybrid labs with great STEM content. They're located in the New York area. They've been expanding up and down um, the East Coast. But basically, they're mailing STEM kits to participating students. They have an incredible track record of inspiring underrepresented students to consider um, an engineering education. Um, it's an organization that I will be working closely with in my next chapter. And then also, Carl Reed introduced me to an organization called Code for Life. They're teaching coding and web development to middle school students in low income areas in the South Bronx and East Harlem. And they're equipping these students with both uh, life skills and also with tech skills. And then finally, I have to give a shout, a shout out to our K through 12 program because they have for many years been uh, providing cutting edge programs and labs with incredible STEM, STEM content every summer, every summer, again, fueling our diversity pipeline. And they, and they are tracking the data because we're very interested in seeing how these students in these programs translate to Tandon engineering students. So thank you so much. Um, the contact information is in the chat. Um, I think Alethea is putting that in there for me. And there's also um, contact information about a new organization called STEM Impact, which I will talk about um, before I close. So now, I, I am just so delighted to have these three representatives from US National Laboratories. First, I'm going to introduce Terrence Buck from Idaho National Lab. Formerly, he was at, um, he came to INL in 2017 uh, from Brookhaven National Lab, where he worked for many years as a senior inclusion and diversity consultant. Um, after a year and a half in actually that role that I just mentioned, is the new role at INL. That's, that's the ro role he assumed when he first came to INL. But after a year and a half in that role, he became the new senior talent acquisition diversity lead. And working in this position, he helped to increase the pool of diverse candidates applying to INL and ultimately being hired. And now Terrence has been promoted again. He is the new talent acquisition manager reporting to the HR directorate. And as a strategic leader, he develops, he mentors, he supports the members of his recruiting team now. Um, he also serves as a member of the HR leadership management team responsible for developing HR initiatives such as the annual lab plan and the lab agenda. He is a team centric leader with the ability to maintain composure under pressure. I smiled when I read this. He has a strong presence of integrity, open communications and ethical discernment. Um, and again, and he didn't mention this, I, I've known Terrence for some time now. He is a dedicated advocate for students seeking careers in this industry. So please, Terrence, welcome to you and please join us. Oh my God, thank you so much, Anita. Um, I, first of all, to be on this panel with these people, oh wow, I've actually made it now, I gotta tell you. You, Dr. Carl Reed, Dr. Coleman. Oh my goodness! I listen. I'm I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm thrilled. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done. And, and if we have time, we'll go into that more. But I'm going to take a little time and talk about our laboratories and my laboratory, and kind of just give people a quick uh, quick overview of kind of what we do and, and how we do it. Uh, let's get here. All right, hopefully this is coming out in slideshow. I can't tell. Yes, you're good. We can see it. Okay, great. So first of all, I'm out here in Idaho National Laboratory. Everybody in the audience is saying, where is that? Not Iowa, uh, it's Idaho. Idaho is, uh, I'm in Southeast Idaho. Actually, it's a beautiful place I'm about. Uh, an hour and a half from um, from Jackson, Wyoming, uh, Jackson Hole, which is an incredible place, about an hour from, hour and a half from Yellowstone, about three hours from uh, Salt Lake City, but most importantly, it's about an eight hour drive from Las Vegas. So that's a good thing. Uh, 
Parents, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but but I just wanted to let you know that it's not in slideshow. We're seeing it, but it's not in okay. slideshow. Do you want to try to make an adjustment? You before you can, you're awesome. You're good. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So um Idaho National Laboratory is one of the 17 national laboratories. And I'm telling you, uh, as Anita mentioned, I, I spent a lot of years, because I'm about 100 years old, spent a lot of years out at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. I'm a Long Island guy. And uh, I, I had my experience of, of working at two different uh, laboratories, but visiting all of them. And I, I must say, uh, you know, Idaho National Laboratory is one of the largest, but it's also one of the most powerful, uh, being the laboratory that is uh, the essentially the, the nuclear national laboratory of the family. Uh, we have uh, probably about 5,000 plus people, and uh, you just heard Anita tell you guys that I'm in charge of uh, talent acquisition. So it's a lot of people and a, a lot of people that we place. And, uh, I put a special emphasis on making sure that we get diverse candidates and well-rounded applicant pools at, at my laboratory. Uh, our vision, INL will change the world's energy future and secure our critical infrastructure. That right there had me just like, I gotta leave Brookhaven because if I tell somebody I work for a lab that has that kind of vision, that's just unbelievable to me. So uh, I'm very excited about what I do, our values, uh, excellence, integrity, ownership, teamwork, safety. But let me tell you what we just added, inclusion. To Dr. Reed and Dr. Coleman, uh, for what you guys said, we, we have added inclusion as one of INL's values. And we mean what we say. I've been here three years, three and a half years now, and we've doubled the uh, women and underrepresented people here. And we're looking to do even more. I want to give you guys a quick, quick uh, look at the 17 national laboratories and where they're located. We have a representative from Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. We also have a representative from the um, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. But you can see these labs are spread throughout the nation. And the one good thing I'll tell you is I've been to all of them and I would love for you all to work for me at INL but I have connections everywhere and I'm not greedy. As long as you can get in STEM and work for a national laboratory, I'm certainly willing to help you. So uh, my email was on the title page, but I, I mean that when I say that, my goal is to get more diversity in STEM throughout the nation. So uh, take a look at these laboratories. Brookhaven is a great laboratory to be at. Uh, I will tell you that uh, SLAC is a great laboratory, Pacific Northwest. Um, Lawrence Livermore, all great laboratories that all do different things. So if you get a chance to go to the DOE website and check them out, please do. A little bit more about my site. It's huge. Uh, guys, I, I work in, a, I work in uh, what they call the town office here, which is about 15 minutes from my house. But when you start to go to the different sites we have, like our reactors and our materials fuels complex, uh, we're talking about 45 minutes to an hour and a half away. So it's 890 square miles. Uh, we have four reactors. We have two spent fuel pools and 400 plus buildings. So our laboratory is huge. What we do, we uh, have a uh, nuclear science and technology. We have an advanced test reactor. We do materials and fuels complex. Uh, our energy and environment is uh, doing a ton of work in the clean energy sector and also the national and homeland security, which all, let me just put a plug in for that. Uh, I've been working on a project for about eight months now and our uh, national and homeland security director, his name is Zach Tudor. Uh, I wrote up a, a um, reference letter for him to become a black engineer of the year in the government sector. And I just got an email two weeks ago that he was named uh, Black Engineer of the Year for the government sector and the work that he's doing in that sector. Um, it's a great coup for him and, and very excited for him and our laboratory. This is what we're working on. We have a, a Mars rover that we're working on. We're working on some small modular reactors. We do the battery technology for electric vehicles, uh, power grid. Uh, we are all over the place and we are one of the laboratories 
with a nice budget. We have a nice bank roll of money and I love trying to give it away. So on that end, I'm gonna close it there and I'm really thankful to be here. And, and I have to tell you guys, I've known Anita a long time and she is a special woman. She does a lot, a lot of work. I'll never forget when I came to NYU first, I was a bigger dude and I, I came in to meet them. I, I was dressed, but hey, I, I'm gonna be honest here. My suit was kind of big. I lost a lot of weight. She told me after we became friends, she said, I thought you bought your, your big brother's suit, but now I'm, I'm styling and profiling a little bit better. So hopefully you can appreciate that. And thank you, Anita. Thank you for the panel for having me. I really appreciate you. <laughs> thank you so much, Terrence. You and Lisa are just telling too many personal stories here, but we'll talk about that after this is over. I, this is just, again, th th I'm so excited about First of all, Terrence organized um, this, this mini lab panel. And I just, again, I'm just so pleased. Please, let, let me bring on our next lab representative. I'd like to introduce you to Barbara Harrison. She is from Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Barbara has over 15 years of experience as a recruiter, nine of which have been in human resources. As the equity, diversity, and inclusion business partner, she serves as a lead in equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy. This includes developing and overseeing the lab's diversity and inclusion plan, and as well as attracting and retaining a more diverse workforce. She is responsible for promoting diversity through learning and development and employee resource groups, and also works with the lab's research staff, staff to recruit and maintain more diverse postdoctoral staff as a pipeline to the future workforce. Please, a warm welcome. Barbara, please join us. Hi, everyone. Uh, Anita, this is my first time meeting you, but we will connect because I want to sure. be able to tell a story like everyone else. Um, Terrence, thank you again for inviting me. I really, truly appreciate it. I will um, share my screen. I have one slide that I would like to, to share. Um, so just a moment. And so let's see here. All right, so I work at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, we sit off of Route 1, um, about three miles from Princeton University. We are, as Terrence mentioned, a um, national DOE lab as well, and we've been managed by Princeton University since 1951. And so at PPPL, we develop a scientific understanding and key innovations needed to realize fusion as a safe and economic energy source for the world. We have about um, probably almost 600 employees now. When I first started in 2018, we had about 4,000, uh, excuse me, uh, 400 and have grown um, to almost 600 um, to date. So again, as we move on to our pledge and our mission um, in the equity and diversity and inclusion space, as Anita mentioned, I, our main focus is to reflect how the communities that we live in. Um, that is our, we want our staff population to be diverse. Um, we wanna strengthen the par parallel initiatives to diversify Princeton and PPPL's engineering, the postdoc and the graduate students. Um, my commitment to the development uh, for uh, pipeline development for apprenticeship and internships are uh, vital um, and our benefits um, and policies, we have to keep an eye on that as well because we do want equity for all employees. So my role again is to provide workforce diversification, um, as many mentioned on the panel, intentionally embedding inclusion and reducing biases throughout the candidate life, uh, life cycle. Um, also with development and retention of talent, 
um, through achieving and maintaining parity and experience, performance, advancement, and retention. And lastly, culture of inclusion. So creating a culture of inclusion and belonging. That's been our key word here tonight, belonging. Um, and making sure again to embed diversity, equity, and accessibility into our day-to-day -day operations. Because again, everyone deserves a seat at the table. Um, I am also a liaison uh, for the ERGs um, at the laboratory. Um, we have about four or five. Um, as a whole, Princeton University has over uh, 10, but at the laboratory, we felt since we are on our own little island that we wanted uh, staff to have um, their groups at the laboratory. Also, I'm involved heavily with uh, APS, Inclusion, Diversity and Equity Alliance team that just formed this year. And also we became, with thanks to Terrence with helping with this, a member of GEM this year. So I will stop sharing, but again, thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate being on this panel and I look forward to talking with the students more. My email address, just for those who uh, may want to get it from the chat is B as in Barbara, H-A-R-R-I-S-O at pppl.gov. They cut off my N as we all know with IT, um, they will do that, but it's B Harriso at pppl.gov. Thank you, Anita. Barbara, thank you so much. We'll make sure that we get that up also. Oh, it's already appeared in there. It has, thank you again for everyone. Thank you. So now our last presenter is Jahi Sembe from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Jahi is the Senior Manager of Workforce Strategy and Development in Human Resources. In this role, he partners with the lab to build an integrated strategy and plan for the workforce of the future, primarily focusing on internship and postdoctoral programs. Prior to his position, he was the assistant dean in the Office of Graduate Studies at Colorado School of Mines. Earlier in his career, he worked as a structural analyst for Ball Aerospace at Boulder. Please give a warm welcome to a virtual welcome to Jahi Sembe. Thank you so much, Dean Farrington. Um, yes, and I want to give special thanks to Terrence for this opportunity to join with you this evening. Um, if it wasn't for Terrence, I don't think I'd be here. So a uh, special shout out to Terrence. He's, he's my brother. He's, he's always reaching out and, and working on connecting the national laboratories. Um, and it's Jahi Simbai, and again, I've been at NREL for about a year and a half, and so relatively new and happy to be here. I, I have a, a couple of slides I can, I can share, and I know we, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'll do a real quick overview of what NREL is, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll go to Q&A. So let's see if I can do this without causing a lot of havoc. Um, so the, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or we, we like to say NREL. We're located in, in Golden, Colorado, which is about uh, 20 minutes west of downtown Denver. Uh, so beautiful, come on out uh, as soon as we get uh, safe to do that. Love to have you come around, see where we are situated near the mountains and so forth and so on. Our main campus is in Golden, Colorado. We do have a, a site at in Boulder, Colorado called the Flatirons Campus which houses our National Wind Technology Center. And we have a new site that's actually up in Fairbanks, Alaska called the Cold Climate Housing Resource Center or the CCHRC. Um, again, my main role is to find interns and postdocs and let you have a fantastic experience while you're at NREL, figuring out what's next for you if it's at the lab or another national lab or in industry or in academia, that's the main focus. Um, we work with renewable energy technologies at NREL and also very interested in energy efficiencies. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about our group, which is the Workforce Development Group at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Our critical objectives, we have three that we, we kind of promote. One is diversity, access, and inclusion, which is 
fits in well with what we're talking about tonight. Um, we don't seem to have a problem with finding interns in general, postdocs in general, but more diverse, underrepresented postdocs, interns, there's work to be done and we know this. Um, a lot of growth has happened at the National Lab in the last three or four years, even before I got there. We need to figure out how to best support this past growth and also be prepared to support the future growth. And there's a lot of talent at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and in our group. We wanna make sure that we're telling our story well to our internal um, colleagues and our external partners like you. So you understand who we are. A lot of people don't know about NREL and the work that we do. So we gotta get better at telling our story. And our mission is to passionately advance the mission of NREL by creating and sustaining, cultivating strategic pathways. And I like the word pathway, I'll stop there. And in, in, in terms of pipeline, I understand it. I worked at Colorado School of Mines, a lot of petroleum work there, a lot of pipeline ideas. I get worried about the word pipeline because uh, you know it, it gives this idea of a single pathway. And with you, when you have a single pathway, you have leaks. And so, although there is a normal pathway in pipeline into a place like NREL or graduate school or things like that, if you don't follow that traditional path, doesn't mean that you can't find another way in. So I'm very interested in those strategic pathways uh, for interns in our place, postdoctoral researchers and others to work within the lab, further their knowledge and careers in the fields of renewable energy and energy efficiency. So I'll stop there and just say thank you again for the opportunity. And let's, let's do some Q&A. Okay. Thank you so thank you so much. I appreciate it. And um, and so let me just say this: for any of you that want to quickly, um, because we are we are really on on the the outside of seven o'clock, and I want to be mindful. Um, and there is um, a final event going on. So again, I just want to um, I just want to say I'm a little bit overwhelmed here. Um, and I think, hold on. I'm back. Am I back? Yes, I am. So um, again, I just, let me just close tonight. Um, I just want to say thank you once again to um, all of the speakers. This is, I'm a little bit overwhelmed. Um, you are all indeed catalysts for change, truly inspirational. Um, as many of you know, I, I, this is it for me. This is my last final event. I've had an amazing career at NYU over the years, and I'm looking forward to my next chapter in January. I'm launching my LLC. It's called STEM Impact, which will solely be devoted to working with companies and with organizations and colleges uh, dedicated to increasing the pipeline of STEM education and careers for historically underrepresented students and for females. So this event for me has been a perfect ending and a perfect beginning for me. Um, I'm just overwhelmed by friends who have joined tonight. I've been looking at the chat. I've been so distracted because the chat has just been so kind, the comments. Um, great content tonight. I can't think of a better way to um, drop the mic, as they say, but I'm not disappearing because I'm doing pipeline work. And most of the people that are here tonight are committed and passionate about this work. Um, to my students and my alumni, thank you for the joy and for allowing me to have a small part in your growth and in your development over the years. I even have an alum from Stern Business School. Doris Givens, a shout out. That's where I started many years ago at NYU. And uh, just so, so happy to see you here. Um, to my colleagues for your support, your friendship over the years. Randy and Alethea, I owe, I owe the success of this summit to both of you, to both of you, um, my right, my left, both sides of my brain sometimes. And of course, um, I've always been um, gifted with such a strong professional team, my student affairs team, Mike and Rose and Sarah and Brittany, thank you so much, so much appreciation. So until the next time, good health, stay safe and peace, peace to all of you. Thank you, thank you so very much. Uh, wish you well, bye-bye now, thanks for coming.